preparing the live stream and then I'll just send the link. I'll give, uh, give people like two minutes to settle in. Yeah. There's a link. I'm gonna click start webinar. This is like mission control. Yeah. Okay, we're going to get started. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. And uh, thank you for joining us for this webinar about MIT OpenCourseWare, Origins, Pathways, and Possibilities. I'm Kurt Newton. I'm a director of OpenCourseWare. And we're just so glad that you're uh, joining us today to review you know, where we've been, how we got here, and where we're going. Just a, uh, a couple of quick notes to get us started. There is closed captioning available, which you can access uh, on the uh, Zoom toolbar. And we also welcome your questions. Uh, please use the Q&A feature, and we will uh, make sure to, to save a few minutes at the end uh, to, 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 take, to take a few of those. We also have people who are manning that Q&A and maybe answering some of the questions online as we go. All right, I want to start us off just by giving you a quick preview of the things we're going to talk through. I'm joined by uh, several of my colleagues on the OCW publication leadership team, uh, and they'll be talking through different aspects of, of OCW, how we work with faculty, our technology, our intellectual property approach, uh, our use of social media and other community building mechanisms, how we use video, and uh, how we are focused in particular on educators these days. And I'll wrap up, come back and wrap up with a uh, uh, kind of a preview of several exciting things that are next in the OCW program. And then uh, again, finally, a few, uh, a few Q and A's at the end. So I wanna start off nearly 20 years ago, almost to the day, April 4th, 2001, MIT OpenCourseWare was announced to the world. And that launch included a founding dual mission. The first of which was to publish freely the materials from virtually all MIT courses. And that's what we're gonna focus on today. There was a very important second uh, component to that mission, which was to um, use what we started at MIT to help launch and build a resources movement. Uh, and we're so glad that uh, the OE Global Consortium is sponsoring this OE Week. Uh, event and uh, and that movement is very very healthy and vibrant and we're just glad to be part of it. We summarize our mission as unlocking knowledge and empowering empowering minds through sharing all of these materials. Open Courseware today is at its core a website with open education resources from thousands of MIT courses, syllabi, lecture notes, lecture videos, and all kinds of content. Um, it represents a true collective achievement. Um, we have contributions at this point from 1,735 MIT faculty and lecture, lecturers, over 9,000 individual contributors who've granted permission to us to use their materials, individual images and what have you, and uh, the collective achievement of, of our team. 
Um, we're really lucky at MIT to be able to um, to have you know this this staff that works with the faculty to bring these materials to you. It takes about 16 people, you know, kind of full time effort right now. You see some of their pictures here. Uh, nine folks who are dedicated to the publication process, the mechanics of individual faculty and in their courses brought out to you, um, media production, technology, our educator initiative, intellectual property, fundraising, and myself as the director round out the team. It truly takes a village to bring all this content to you. Beyond that core website, for many years, we've also been branching out and experimenting with other, other ways to, uh, to deliver content. It's not just the MIT curriculum from the classroom, but also supplemental resources. It's uh, increasingly using the YouTube channel as a, as, a, as a way to meet people where they are looking for educational resources. Um, continuing to reflect the technology base that classroom education is happening in MIT, for instance, our mechanisms to, to support interactive assessments and telling not just what MIT is teaching through our OER, but also how we teach through instructor insights and the podcast. And over the course of this hour, you know, you'll be hearing from other people in the OCW team about how some of these experiments and branching out uh, uh, programs are working. Uh, in terms of impact, OpenCourseWare at this point, 1.6 billion page views since our launch. Um, 196 million, almost 200 million unique learners, and the largest .edu YouTube channel in terms of subscriber base. We're coming up on 3 million in the next couple of months. Um, over 430 copies of the complete OCW website on a hard drive shipped out to locations around the world that are lacking in, uh, in enough internet bandwidth to, uh, to get to our servers. Um, these are some of the the reach and impact metrics that we feel really, really pleased by, and uh, just so gratified by, by uh, the hunger for learning that's shown from around the world. Who are these users that are coming to MIT OCW? Based on our last detailed user survey in 2015, fully half of them are enrolled students. Um, about 45% of them are independent curious learners as well. You know, uh, people who are doing it for professional purposes or just driven by their curiosity. And that 5% slice that's educators, we think are particularly important because of the multiplication effect. When we get content in their hands and they're using it with their students, they have the greatest impact. And it's truly a global audience. Well, MIT is a United States institution, over 70% of our traffic this year came from outside the United States. Just an indication of the global hunger for this knowledge and people's use of, of open education resources. Those are numbers about our users, but the stories are even more compelling. And there's a number of these on our website, which people can check out. A couple that I'll highlight here, um, people who are using uh, OCW to get through disruptions in, in, their, in their course of study, university students who are um, prevented from getting to class because of, of conflict. Uh, another really powerful story, uh, people are using OCW to change their careers. And when they're really motivated, they can do amazing things. Teach yourself how to do software engineering in the course of six months and get a job at Google. It can be done just because all of this material is up there freely available for you to use. We're only here also because of this global movement of open education resources. And we have such gratitude for all of the people who've, who've joined us over the past, uh, the past couple of decades to make this happen. So whether you're an adapter and an adopter of open education resources, you're pr producing tools, repositories to help people find them, jumping in and collaboratively working with content, and getting in the hands of students uh, to lower their cost of curriculum, um, OER librarians taking you know, increasingly strong role in this, all the nonprofits and companies that are helping get this material in the hands of learners and educators when they need it, the funders. And last but not least, the, uh, all of this coming together in this consortium. Uh, thank you, OE Global, again, for, for hosting us here from the, uh, I think, 2005-ish launch of the OCW Consortium through its various incarnations. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for this 
network of collaboration. And we're so delighted to uh, welcome the first president of the OCW Consortium, Steve Carson, who's rejoined us here at MIT. Uh, uh, Steve, would you like to say hello? Yeah, hi, it's great to be here. It's great to participate in this event. And, and hello to all the colleagues around the world that I haven't talked to in some time. Um, just if I could say really quickly, somewhere out there on the web, there's a wonderful video on starting a movement that features uh, a crazy guy dancing on a hillside at a concert. And the video plays through where, where all of the other people on the hillside, so one at a time, start to join and dance with this person. And they make the point that a crazy person dancing on a hillside is not a movement. It's just a crazy person dancing on a hillside. And, you know, it's great that Kurt is able to share these big numbers and, it, you know, we were proud of what OCW has achieved. But when we started the OE movement um, or when the OE movement was getting started, we were just a small uh, project that really hadn't proven anything. And it didn't become a movement until those brave uh, first adopters stood up and joined us and said, hey, we want to do the same thing. We see the value in this. And it wouldn't have been a movement if it wasn't for all of the other organizations around the world who joined and turned what we were doing with OpenCourseWare into a global phenomenon. So I want to say thank you to all of those folks around the world who made this happen. And again, it's just great to participate in this event. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. All right. With that, I'd like to... Uh hand it on to my colleague, Elizabeth DiRienzo to talk about how we work with faculty. Thanks, Kurt. Um, I am one of two publication managers on the OpenCourseWare team. And in fact, I've been part of the team from the very start. Next slide. So what I wanna tell you about is um, how did we get faculty on board in the first place? A little bit about how we maintain faculty relationships even now, some uh, about our publication process and team, and a few ideas about changes and innovations um, in our work. Next slide. So when OpenCourseWare first started, it was a new idea. It was very highly supported by the uh, MIT community, but it was a little bit hard to get it off the ground. So what we did is we started by meeting with department heads and academic officers, we really had to make sure they understood um, what was OpenCourseWare about, how would it benefit their department, how would it benefit their faculty, their students, and, you know, and also the world. We also looked for kindred spirits, people who were already sharing openly. One of those, for example, was Professor Gil Strang, and he had in 1999 actually recorded a full set of lecture videos for his famous linear algebra course. Well, once he heard about OpenCourseWare, he was ready and willing to share that on the OpenCourseWare site. So those, those things were really, really useful. What was um, kind of a challenge was to clarify what sharing under our Creative Commons license was and what it wasn't. There was a lot of fear that if you shared your material under this license, you were giving up your rights under copyright. And you'll hear more about, um, about that later. We also had to address concerns that were really not that hard to understand. For example, um, what if I'm writing lecture notes that I wanna someday turn into a book? Will I still be able to find a publisher? Or will they say, this stuff is already out there? So we had to provide some ideas about how to protect their interests going forward. Um, another concern for when we did videos was if I record this class, will students even come? Well, that wasn't really that hard to, um, to fix because we weren't sharing them in real time. We were recording classes that would then be published later. Um, we also needed to address concerns like, um, how much do I have to share? And the answer was, you can share as much as you're comfortable with or as little. So for example, um, there was a lot of concern about what if I share problem sets and solutions? Can I use those problem sets again in the future? So you'll see a lot of our courses have um, problem sets with no solutions or limited solutions. But one thing we did is we said, could we find some older solutions and, and put those up there as representative problems with solutions? Next slide, please. 
So I think we based our building relationships and maintaining relationships on this idea that we had a goal of keeping MIT faculty time to less than five hours for the entire time we were working with them. Was that always the case? No. Sometimes it was more, sometimes it was less. But we tried to clarify with people that they had these responsibilities. The faculty were responsible for ensuring the quality and content of the pedagogy. They had to license their course materials to us. They had to help us identify third party materials. And I will say over time, people are getting better at giving proper credit or letting us know where they got source materials. And then of course they had to review and approve the course before it was published. Everything else is up to the open course routine. That included collecting and formatting all of the content, identifying and clearing the third party objects. That's been a huge task. And I am, you're gonna hear more about IP later. We also sometimes provide content services such as recording video, recording audio, hiring students to help type up lecture notes, things like that. And then our team puts the content into our Oak CW systems. We manage the website and we respond to user feedback. You'll hear a little bit about user feedback later. Um, one of the things that was really great to realize is that Right now we have, I'm trying to think of the number, about 60%, um, I think, is it 60% per, that we have participating? Something like that of the faculty. That's about right. Yeah, um, and, and sometimes they even come to us and say, hey, I just taught a, an interesting course. Would you be able to put that on OpenCourseWare? Uh, next slide. This is just a, general overview of our publication process. It starts with recruiting faculty, recruiting a course, and it takes us all the way through preparing their content, building the course site, um, doing final QA, and then publishing the course. Um, ideally, we would say any given course would be done within six months or less. Sometimes they're done really quickly. A pretty straightforward course can be published within a, a month or two after we start building it. However, there are some courses that are much more complex, have a lot of intellectual property, um, objects that have to be cleared or dealt with, a lot of content that has to be worked on, or a lot of video that has to be edited. And again, you'll hear more about video later. Next slide. So as I think about the future of working with faculty and, and working on these courses, I think about um, all the technology that we've used over the years and how it needed to be improved. And you'll hear more about next generation um, OCW content management system next up. And um, we're trying out little experiments sometimes. Some of them work, some of them don't, but our, our latest one is to think about putting source files online, not just PDFs. So we wanna put on uh, Word documents, um, LaTeX documents, PowerPoint files, these be much easier for people to reuse. And then we've also fairly recently launched um, the Open Learning Library. Again, you'll hear more about that, but it's a way for OpenCourseWare to share some of its content where the um, course materials have interactive assessments and more. So with that, um, I will turn it over to Joe Martis. Hello, everybody. My name is Joe Martis. I am the technical production manager for MIT OpenCourseWare. I've been with MIT for about 11 years, working to further open education through OpenCourseWare, MITx, and now Open Learning Library. Uh, I just want to start off painting a little bit of a picture of what consumer technology was like back in 2001. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? Uh, so in 2001, uh, if you can imagine the iPod first launched and the big promise with the iPod was a thousand songs in your pocket. Just that was mind blowing at the time. Imagine where we are now. Uh, the first cell phones were launched with Bluetooth and color screens. Uh, first time a calendar appeared on a cell phone. Uh, Wikipedia was launched. The Xbox was launched. Windows XP, iTunes. This was, this was the beginning of a whole new technology movement. Uh, and we were right there. Uh, next slide, please. So in 2001, we had a goal of publishing 500 courses within two, two years. We needed a way to manage all this content. 
we had to develop custom workflows, a uh, custom publication system, a distribution system. Uh, we needed to figure out how to get our content to people online, offline, everywhere we could in the world. Uh, we needed it quickly. Uh, we needed it uh, to be discoverable. We had a lot of needs around this. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we chose the Microsoft Content Management Server 2002. Uh, that is the precursor to what is uh, SharePoint today. So if you can imagine what SharePoint is today, imagine what it was like 20 years ago. Uh, we chose the system because of its scalability, its reliability, its ease of deployment, its ease of customization, and a strategic partnership with Microsoft. Um, there wasn't, uh, there weren't a lot of solutions out there at the time, and this was definitely uh, the most robust we could find. Uh, next slide. Uh, so I just want to show you really quickly uh, about the foundation of the technology. So uh, it was uh, Microsoft Content Management System 2002 hosted at MIT locally. Uh, our distribution was handled by the Akamai network. Offline distribution, as Kurt mentioned, was done on the Mirror program. Uh, our archiving is done uh, in DSpace with MIT. Uh, at the time, we were running web trends, and we use uh, FileMaker for all of our administrivia. Uh, next slide. Uh, 2003, we hit 500 courses. Uh, we had about 500,000 visitors a month, so things were picking up. The heat was on. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 2007, we hit 1,800 courses and we're about a million visitors a month. So uh, traffic was picking up, our content was growing, uh, systems were starting to bulge at the seams. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 2009, video became a thing. Uh, video wasn't really online very much before then. Uh, so we got on the video, video bandwagon. Um, hosting was very, very expensive at the time, so we partnered with YouTube, uh, which we still continue today. Uh, we also partnered with JW Player, which at the time was an open source uh, video player. Uh, we employed Google Search Appliance, which gave us great, uh, much greater discoverability through Google. And at that time, we employed Google Analytics as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, 2012, uh, as I mentioned, we were busting at the seams with content and, uh, and traffic. So we went uh, through a major effort to replace our content management system, uh, refresh the look and feel of the site, uh, re-architect the data model underneath. And we chose Plone 3 at the time. Uh, it was chosen because it was open source uh, and for all the other reasons that we chose Microsoft in the beginning. Uh, we hired an external firm called Embolden to work on look and feel with us. And that is the site we have today. Next slide, please. Uh, 2018, we ran into some major problems. We were still tied to physical hardware and that started failing. Um, so at that time we moved to virtualize everything. Um, so we virtualized our entire authoring platform uh, and moved our hosting to a, uh, a new CDN. And this has given us stability and gotten off the physical hardware that'll get us through. Uh, next slide. And so here we are 21, 20 years later, uh, we've had hundreds and hundreds of code releases, made uh, hundreds of enhancements to the site, UX changes, added countless features. And uh, now it's time to sunset the current platform and start working on a new one that we refer to as next generation OCW. And you'll be hearing more about that in the, in the uh, coming months. So thank you very much. And I think we are on to intellectual property. Hi, thanks, Joe. Um, I'm Lindsay Wiramuni. I'm the intellectual property manager for OpenCourseWare at MIT, as well as MITx. My tenure on this project goes all the way back almost to the very beginning uh, in 2003. That was when I came on board. Uh, next slide. The very first initial launch of MIT OpenCourseWare, um, we pegged intellectual property right off the bat as something that was a problem that needed to be solved or figured out, or how the heck are we gonna handle this? Um, so we were, we were aware of it as an issue, um, 
And we started to think about how to handle it. At the same time, the Creative Commons uh, was being founded simultaneously. Now this wasn't um, a joint founding project, but there was a Venn diagram overlap there that was in the shape form of uh, MIT professor Hal Abelson, who was both on the founding team for MIT OpenCourseWare and the Creative Commons. So they both emerged into the open space that was slowly taking shape uh, right at the same time. Next slide. In response to the New York Times article, uh, we had to figure out what to do about copyright. We had to come up with workflows and come up with policy. What it uh, came down to right off the bat was a lot of scanning the content that came from the faculty. We licensed what we could. We scrubbed much more content than we wanted to, but it was the best that we could do at the time with what we knew we could do. Um, we knew that licensing uh, what we could expanded the commons. So that seemed like an asset for us, but we knew there were limitations. So in 2010, I led a project to release the code of best practices for fair use in open courseware. Um, that the benefits of that were immediate in that we were able to publish richer, more complete courses that were more authentic to what the students were getting in the classroom. It still wasn't hundred percent, but you know, because copyright and it never will be. Um, looking into the future, we hope to explore the possibility of expanding our use of different Creative Commons licenses. We also know that we need to find efficiencies to be able to scale up for more projects like uh, next gen, but also other projects that might come down in the pipeline in MIT in the future. Next slide, please. So the, there were some big questions that I saw bubbling up over the years. Some of them were long simmering, others came out of um, nowhere by some very smart people. There was a question of, do we wanna balance permission cultures against fair use? Is that a mutually exclusive space or is it to everyone's benefit that we license as much as possible in order to expand what's available in the commons? Um, and in 2008, there was uh, a question at open ed that was raised by Hal Plotkin and he raised for the first time that I had heard the question of accessibility. He described it as, this is the thing that could make the wheels come off the bus. For MIT, that meant um, captions for the videos that we were capturing and filming and producing because without accessibility um, implementations like captions, for example, we were, leaving out a whole host of the community of users around the world that really needed our content and OER in general. The following year at the plenary of open ed, I remember, I don't recall his name, but he raised the question of colonization. What is it that we are actually doing and producing, putting out there in the world? Um, should we shift our resources and energies to support open educational resources that are coming out of the global south, rather than pushing our materials out from the United States and Europe um, to, you know, without a lot of regard at the time, at least from MIT's perspective of what was locally useful and appropriate. Um, and his recommendation was really, you know, think about this we ought to get out of our ivory towers and open up our minds and the definition of what a truly global open educational movement can be. Next slide. So there are gaps in our evolution as well as opportunities. Um, translations have been an interesting out come of what we've published. We've had several partners over the years um, formally, but 
we certainly don't know what we don't know about translation projects. Um, I don't know whether putting a lot of energy around translations is necessarily a good thing, um, see colonization, but we are really, really glad that Creative Commons exists to enable that for folks who think that is appropriate and need that for their communities. Um, as was mentioned earlier, we have opportunities around publishing more source files, fewer PDFs, because PDFs are really hard to make accessible. They're really hard to reverse engineer and make more readily shareable. Um, and that's a goal that we have, an opportunity for growth. And the last thing I wanted to say is to like give a shout out to this movement as a whole for elevating the issue around copyright and elevating librarians in this space to turning and inventing OER librarian. It's an actual role in academic libraries now. And that was something that nobody even thought anyone needed back in the day. So well done us. Um, as a librarian, I'm pleased to give a shout out to all my colleagues in the in the world. Um, so that is the story of copyright. I will hand it off to my colleague Cheryl next, who will talk about community. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, hi, I'm Cheryl. Um, I'm one of the uh, publication managers, along with Elizabeth. And my other hat that I roll that I wear um, is the uh, social media coordinator. So I'd like to talk to you today about community and how we build community. So as you've heard, we've had we have really amazing content that we put out there. Um, but how do we get that content to you? And how do we hear back from you? Um, and how do we create this this community of that's just a website? Um, so we have, from the very beginning, we've had um, a newsletter that we put out monthly, as well as an email feedback system, where we have people answering your emails every single day. Uh, we get thousands and thousands of them. Um, and so we are able to have a nice back and forth there. But the main way is social media, which is a job that I started a few years ago. Um, I luckily inherited a very robust uh, Facebook and Twitter account. Um, so we have about 500,000 and 200,000 uh, followers respectively. Um, so that um, definitely helped, but we had to start from the ground up. In 2019, I made the decision to join Instagram because so many of our followers uh, lived there. You know, and we have such great visual content. Um, so, um, yeah, we've been doing well there. We have about 7,000 followers there. Uh, we are also on LinkedIn um, to help professionals connect and to foster workplace learning. Next slide, please. So as I've just said, we've had tremendous amount of growth. We started from zero, um, just like, you know, when anybody opens up an account. Um, and then slowly it started to gain traction. we in 2009 was when we started Facebook and Twitter, and it turns out YouTube as well. And that was a very different field than it is now. It was a lot less crowded. Um, so eventually we would get a few hundred joining us a month. Then it became thousands. And then it snowballed from there, it was an avalanche. Um, so the things that we do to, to engage and to grow our audience is to constantly put out interesting content and I'm very lucky because my colleagues, you know, do all that great work that, you know, videos and lecture notes and reading lists that I can put out there. There's no lack of material for me to work with. Um, I also like to reshare content that other people, uh, other kindred spirits on the internet uh, put out there. And so we can have, you know, a discussion and not just about OCW. Um, it also has helped to have influencers, bigger groups, um, share our content to their audience, and that has really helped gain um, our followers. So, for one instance, years ago, Bill Gates mentioned how he liked watching OCW videos, and so as you can imagine, that did a lot for us. Um, but ultimately, it was the um, putting some money towards uh, growing our audience that really, really helped. Next, please. 
So um, it's really important to know your audience. Um, what makes them think? What makes them laugh? And then more importantly, how do we get them to our site so they have the opportunity to experience all of our great stuff? Um, so the social media connection that we have and the newsletter and uh, feedback emails um, enables us to hear from you and understand how we can help you learn and what kind of content you want. The answer is video. Everybody wants more video. We hear you. Um, so we like, believe it or not, we like getting feedback um, about what we could do better. Um, we even sometimes have people tell us the link is broken or there's a typo. Um, and But honestly, the best part of my job is that some of the most heartwarming comments, uh, inspiring comments come over social media. So keep those coming, please. Um, I know, having been in this job for a few years, that our audience loves to learn. They love science and math and nerdy humor. And um, so much good work comes out of our office. And I really love finding ways to make sure it's seen. Um, and I have a pretty good sense of what it will inspire people. I hope that you know, it keeps getting honed, but I have an idea. Um, and sometimes the most popular things are not even OCW related, but they create a sense of community, uh, shared interest. So for instance, the other day I posted a video about a teenager making this extensive, crazy Rube Goldberg machine. And so we all got to bond over that, even though it wasn't necessarily getting people to our site. Uh, next, please. So we have lots of different kinds of posts. Um, you know, we have informational posts, new courses, new podcast episodes, the kinds of services and materials that we offer. Next, please. We also have funny posts, at least I hope they're funny. So trying to um, stay current with memes or what the most popular things are like Stranger Things on the left, that's Steve's hair. And uh, May the 4th is always a very popular holiday at, o at MIT. Um, next. We also have outreach and funding kind of posts where we wanna hear from you about how OCW has changed your learning journey. Um, also, you know, we have fundraising because free, the cost of free is not nothing for us. So next please. And the challenges uh, for social media is that social media platforms are getting very, very, very crowded and it's, they're oversaturated, especially Facebook. So how do we continue to stay current and relevant in this really busy space? And how do we start, you know, continue being useful to our, our learners? Um, another challenge is that the current platforms keep changing, but right when you think you learn them, they change. So the algorithms, the formats, the technology changes. Um, and then new platforms seem to pop up every single day, WhatsApp and TikTok and Clubhouse and how to know if to, that's the right space for us and when to join. So, you know, Instagram is sort of the newest uh, iteration for us. Um, and finally, um, we love hearing from you and sharing with you. So thank you so much. And I feel really privileged to be able to connect with you in this way. Um, and so next we're gonna talk about video and I turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Brett. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, there's a lot to talk about with OCW video. So all I'm gonna do is a brief whirlwind tour um, through where we've been with video at OCW and where we're going. Um, next slide, please. Uh, at the beginning, when we started out, uh, video wasn't a big part of what we did at OCW. Um, but it has, as it's been touched on, um, it's grown exponentially over the years. Uh, when we started, uh, my colleague Jason and I, who, who uh, he's monitoring the YouTube chat right now for this live stream, uh, we would just work on video part time, wearing many hats as we do. Uh, we would edit videos. We would even apply a technique called pan and scan for anyone who knows what that's about. Uh, we don't do that anymore, um, but it's grown and now we are approaching 3 million subscribers, which will probably happen in, in uh, April or May of this year. And it's really exciting to see that many people finding our content that way. Um, in terms of how we get the video we get, we get that 
asked a lot. How do we choose what we're going to publish on OpenCourseWare? Uh, how do we make that work? It comes to us in a lot of different ways. Uh, sometimes enterprising faculty and students and TAs or whoever else at MIT will come to us with finished polished videos uh, that we can just put up online and process, uh, caption, which I'll talk about later. Uh, other times we kind of go from scratch. Next slide, please. Uh, where somebody wants their course filmed. And so we, we work with different video vendors who will bring cameras into the classroom if, if need be. This is a, a photo from just over a year ago when we used to have packed classrooms. And that was a very packed class. This is a little tease of a course that's coming soon on OCW, which is Intro to Algorithms, which people are already asking us for. Uh, we know that'll be very popular. Um, other rooms at MIT, next slide, are already equipped with, uh, with everything you need to, to film a class, including, whoops, including live switching capabilities, uh, built-in cameras, even tracking cameras that follow the faculty around as they teach. Uh, and some rooms even come equipped, next slide, with their own dogs named Chester. Um, so this is sort of the exciting thing that we miss seeing on campus. Um, but it's a lot of fun. It's, uh, it's very hectic sometimes getting up a class set up to be filmed. Um, but we see uh, how grateful people are to have these resources shared by MIT faculty, uh, especially on YouTube, where, where most people find them. Then we have a, a sort of extensive post-production process, and that's uh, really where a lot of our work lies, of having the videos edited, uh, having the content reviewed for IP and other things, and also metadata. So metadata is a very important thing. Uh, the keywords, tags, things that will help people find the content that they're actually looking for. Find specific topics even within a lecture uh, that they're looking for on YouTube. And also um, accessibility is, is very, very important. Um, so we make sure uh, that all of our videos are captioned day and date. So as soon as you see them on YouTube, they're already gonna have captions so that they're accessible to everyone uh, at the same time. Uh, next slide. This is uh, the team that makes video specifically happen. Um, not even all of these people are on the OCW staff, but they also help out um, and we have fun and we wouldn't be able to do it without them. Uh, Jim on the bottom right corner, uh, for example, is responsible for setting up light boards at MIT, which are increasingly used by faculty, especially during uh, the pandemic uh, to teach their classes and, and share them with students online. Next slide. Uh, so our, our content is usually a mix of things that we get in the classroom, probably uh, mostly mostly video that we shoot in the classroom, but sometimes we do things like this. This is our beloved Professor Gil Strang, uh, who millions and millions of people around the world have learned from, um, and we receive comments about Gil all the time. So this is something that we did in a studio, a more prepared, scripted, uh, direct to the online audience uh, type of content. So we look uh, looking to the future, uh, we hope to do more things like this. There are some projects, some very ambitious uh, in the works that are this more studio uh, style video uh, for the for the online audience specifically. Uh, also, we'll be doing more podcast episodes, as was already mentioned. I have the, the privilege and the pleasure of working with Sarah Hansen on that. Uh, and that's been very rewarding, too, to sort of reach a different audience where uh, people can't walk around uh, walk down the street looking at YouTube on their phone, but they can listen to a podcast. And so that's given us another avenue to uh, to share what the faculty have to say about how they teach their classes. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah, who's going to talk about our commitment to educators. Hi, thank you. Um, yes, I'm Sarah Hansen, and I lead the OCW Educator Initiative. Next slide, please. MIT OpenCourseWare, as Kurt mentioned, really positions educators as multipliers um, because we see them as individuals who take up open educational resources and then share them with multitudes of people. It's really creating the ripple effect in action. Next slide, please. So very early on, the MIT faculty committed to making OCW even more valuable to educators. And they did this by launching the OCW Educator Initiative. And part of this initiative was 
sharing not only the what of MIT teaching or the content, but also the how or the teaching approaches. Next slide, please. They began to share things like, how do they engage learners? How do they teach novices in a large lecture setting? How do they develop community? How do they teach science communication? Um, all sorts of things that might make the content more useful to educators using the OER with students out in the world. Next slide, please. MIT faculty share their teaching approaches in a section of their OCW courses called Instructor Insights. Um, and they typically do that in three ways currently. One way um, is by text um, in a section of their course. Um, another way is through videos and Brett and I work together on those. Um, and more recently it's in podcast form. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. I'm uh, sorry. It's okay. Something has glitched out here. Um, there we go. Yeah. Um, we launched Chalk Radio back in February 2020, so just about a year ago. Um, and it takes listeners behind the scenes some of the most of some of the most interesting courses on the MIT campus and it brings them into conversation with the faculty who make them happen. Um, and we see this as a commitment to educators because it's really amplifying the importance of teaching on a global scale, um, but it's also encouraging the uptake of OER because all of our guests share their OER on our MIT OpenCourseWare website. And then we link directly to those OER in the show notes. So we're really reaching a lot of people and increasing the discoverability of the OER themselves. Next slide, please. And educators are really tuning in. Since the Educator Initiative was launched in November 2013, Instructor Insights have been viewed over 1.3 million times, which is incredible. Um, and the podcast has been listened to over 200,000 times in just the year since um, it was launched. So we're, we're just like so pleased to be able to bring these resources to people who are eager to take them up. Um, next slide, please. But we know we can't stop here and we don't want to stop here. Uh, we want to refresh our commitment to educators. So what are we thinking about in the near future? Um, we're thinking about exploring collaborations whereby we could take our, the, our OER on OCW to the platforms where teachers are already going. Um, we also, as many of my colleagues have mentioned, are interested in how to make source files more readily available so we can accelerate the OER cycle. Um, and finally, I'm really interested in figuring out how we might make OCW a site where educators can share back the adaptations that they're creating so that when people do discover them on our site, they have access to the work of all the incredible OER educators out there. I think that would be great. Um, it's a future that I'm really excited about. Um, and Kurt, I'm gonna hand it back to you so you can share some information about NextGen. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, picking up on this theme of where we're heading in the future. So OCW's 20th anniversary of our, of our launch uh, is coming up in about a month. And over the course of the coming year, um, uh, a lot of our attention is, is being uh, directed at the launch of a new platform and the refresh of the program, picking up on some of the things, Sarah, that you and others have been talking about here. Um, just quickly, uh, there was a question earlier, I think it was during Lindsay, your talk about the New York Times article. So that, that was an article that came out on the announcement date of April 4th, 2001. Um, anyway, we're coming up on that 20th anniversary and you know, the, the components of this next generation program include you know, a, a renewed commitment to sharing the complete MIT curriculum. You know, we're taking advantage of some uh, platform and technology um, advances and, and other ways of refining how we do our work to keep pace with the rapid evolution of that curriculum. And in particular, to bring to the world, um, you know, the best knowledge that we can about grand challenges, like how the world is grappling with social justice issues, with uh, the imperative to um, improve our sustainability of our, of our societies. 
the the future of computing and all of the all of the ways that that intersects with our world. That new platform for our users offer will offer a number of really exciting things. First and foremost, a seamless experience for all of you who are working off your mobile devices or going back and forth between mobile and and desktop. But in particular, for people for whom their phone is their only device, uh, having OCW work well on smartphones is, is really an equity issue. And that is, you know, really a, a core of where we're trying to head in our in our uh, in our upcoming uh, upcoming program. That progression from giving access to knowledge to really, really driving towards educational equity is, is at the center of it. Um, for the educators amongst us, uh, integrations with learning management systems and new learning platforms is, is another thing that we're putting some attention on. Uh, and I just want to wrap up with, with again, kind of musing on um, how exciting it is to be part of this ever expanding, ever evolving uh, ecosystem working with OER. So things like the, the, the continuous cycle of uh, how people discover content adopt it, adapt it, feed it back into the commons. You know, there's, I think there's some really exciting things that we can be doing together in collaboration uh, to move that forward. And uh, from an equity perspective, um, we're putting some, putting attention on how to, how to collaborate with others to create more effective on-ramps into the content that we've already got, you know, have that, have materials, you know, be customized and individualized for, for the needs of individual learners and their communities and build those things back up into uh, really well-tuned learning pathways. Again, this is all about progress from, you know, the, the, uh, the first bunch of years of OCW has been primarily about the, the power of access. And we've, we've gone a, a long way with that, but we know there's, there's, a, there's a lot more we need to do in order to build a truly equitable educational opportunities for everyone. So we, we know that we can't do this alone, <laughs> not even close. And so really the question is, what, what are the sort of collaborations that we might be able to create to, to take us into the future? Uh, and, I, and I ask you to, to think and to let us know about how can MIT OpenCourseWare, the things that we're able to bring, help support your open education resources goals. We are eager to hear from you. Um, if you... Uh, and you can start by dropping <laughs> some observations like that into the, into the Q&A here um, and definitely reach out to us as well through our website to contact us through our social media feeds. Um, I thank you very much for, uh, for your attention. We've delivered a lot of information and I want to uh, turn our attention now here in the last few minutes to some of the Q&A that we've received. Um, and there are a couple of people who are asking uh, about translations and how we view that. Uh, Lindsay, you in particular focused on um, you know, the, um, the complexities or the nuances about you know, translations, um, the, the colonization aspect about what's worked and what hasn't. Um, I wanted to maybe start by asking you, Lindsay, to just unpack your, your thinking on that a little bit more. Sure. I think translations, um, they're enabled by the license that we use. They're enabled by almost all Creative License, Creative Commons licenses. And I think translations are fabulous. I think that they can share the same space of people that are putting energy into translations as they are making their own materials for their own local communities. Um, our experience with translation partners while their projects were fully active were really, really great but those translation sites um, aren't always persistent and they're hard to sustain. Um, I encourage folks to take advantage of the derivative work capability of the CC license and to translate our materials however uh, works for them. I'm not anti-translations. I think that they should be a complement to the development of localized OER. Um, and hopefully what we find in other parts of the world and in other communities um, can be translated and licensed in such a way that, that can be translated to our own communities and, and sort of perpetuate that circle of life, if you will, for materials. Yeah, yeah, thanks. It's, I think it's really important uh, for us to be viewing this as a, 
you know, not a one way, here's the stuff, y'all translate it, but a, you know, a thing that provides feedback and just continuous evolution for everybody involved. Um, yeah, uh, there, was a, there was another question about the translation specifically about you know, working through kind of institutions or, or other mechanisms. Uh, the formal translation partners that we had, you know, some of them were the brainchild of individual people. Some of them were, were affiliated with institutions. It's been kind of a range of things. Um, uh, um, and we appreciate hearing from people who are just offering as individuals to, um, uh, to help us with translations. And we you know, encourage you to, uh, to go for it. You know, we've got the Creative Commons license there and you're, uh, you're, you're free to run with it. Um, there's another question about, dun, da, da, when can I have more video? Um, yes, that is, I think as, as Brett mentioned, maybe others mentioned, probably the most frequent bit of feedback that we get. I know we recognize how powerful video is as a, as a, um, as a, as a, as a learning, uh, learning content. Um, video is ex more expensive to produce. It's more uh, time and resource intensive. We're doing everything that we possibly can to, to add more video all the time. Um, but, you know, any, uh, I'll put it to my, uh, my colleagues here, anything that, uh, that you'd like to share about how we're thinking about video in this moment and going forward? Anybody? Brett, Liz. I can weigh in on that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we, you know, we would love to have more video. We'd love to have video for all of our courses if that were possible. I mean, obviously the, the cost of video is a barrier to that, um, but also availability and, and, and the, way, um, the way we end up connecting with faculty and certain faculty that are willing to, to uh, have, their, have their courses recorded and others aren't um, for various reasons. Um, but yeah, we're always looking out for it, and we do try to uh, to take these factors into account. We try to look at where we might have gaps in our content, um, and sort of target specific courses and see if people are willing to share. So we'll, you know, we continue to do that as best we can. Um, and people, people's contributions, people's donations to OCW also help with that, of course, in enabling us to uh, to film more courses. Yeah, yeah, I would oh, add that. Um... Oh, sorry, go ahead, Liz. I was just gonna mention that, you know, this really unusual time that we've been living in where the students are not able to be on campus and things are happening remotely. Um, I know in my own experience with the courses and departments that I work with, there have been three courses that have come to my attention that have full video that we will be sharing. And those that's simply because all of the classes were recorded from the instructor's homes and they're, they're, they were uploaded to a website that the students used. And so we're able to use those too. So, um, you know, actually three full courses is a lot for us to process at one time, given our limited staff, but we're working our way through them. Yeah, I would say that we're, uh, we're including video in roughly 20% 20, 20 of the courses we're publishing these days, which is, uh, which is quite a lot more than we, uh, than we did in our, in our first few years. Um, and I expect that faculty producing videos, you know, for blended learning or flipped classroom teaching, some of these things are going to stick after, after we come out of the pandemic shutdowns and we'll, you know, you know, as a, as an ongoing thing, have more video coming our way. So we look forward to bringing that to you. Um, let's see, we're coming right up on the end of the hour. Um, I, there's one additional follow-up question about uh, translations and colonization about um, things like wiki schools. Um, yeah, I think that's, um, you know, the, the structures that are out there, the, the settings for people to come together and recognize a need, you know, for adaptation more broadly, customization, localization. Um, I, I think the better we can do at, at uh, at fostering those collaborations, the better off we'll be, you know. Um, and you know, translation is just one of one of a number of you know uh, mechanisms for for making that kind of um, 
you know, localization, uh, customization. We we want to we want to be supporting that, and we we love to hear from you about situations where you're seeing it work, and you know, specific uh, suggestions for places that uh, that we can uh, we can help you with. All right. Um, well, in closing, I just want again to thank you for joining us. I know for um, preparing to celebrate OCW's 20th anniversary. The future is bright. Uh, we're so appreciative for you know, the, the collaboration and the community that we've got around us here. And we look forward very much to, uh, to the years to come. All right, thank you all. Bye everyone. Bye.